not so long ago, in the mysterious land of Langford, Canada, Canadian rugby was having a crisis. I love Canada. Toronto is my favourite place I've ever been. I've watched Scott Pilgrim vs. The World upwards of a hundred times. And apologising needlessly is one of my favourite hobbies. I even like things about the country that don't sound dismissively typical. And yet, watching Canada play rugby and everything I love at the moment is like seeing a kid jump in a pool, shit himself, then proceed to drown because he can't swim and nobody wants to strip off to save the kid who dropped his kids off at the pool in the pool. Canadian rugby right now is dire and unlike lesser tigers I don't take any pleasure in seeing them struggle and everything they try to do to counter their predicament seems to just push their head further underwater. So what's going on with Canadian rugby and can they turn it around in time for the World Cup? This situation is all the more disappointing because rugby does have a pretty rich history in Justin Trudeau's sexy moose utopia. Versions of the sport have existed in Canada since as far back as 1823 but it began to really gain a foothold after a posho man named Alfred St George Hammersley, an MP, lawyer and one of the founding members of the Canterbury Rugby Union, who also played for England in the first ever test match, moved to Vancouver and made it his mission to spread rugby across British Columbia and eventually Canada as a whole. In the years since, Canada as a whole went on to establish themselves as amongst the best of the rest in test rugby, qualifying for every World Cup and pulling off wins against Argentina, Italy, England A, France, Scotland and Wales in the 90s and the noughties. They even made the quarterfinals of the 91 World Cup, where they defeated Fiji and Romania before putting in a pretty good fight against the All Blacks in the knockouts. However, the heights Canada have hit since have been closer to a CD tower than the CN tower. One win in 95, 99 and 03 each. Then in both 2007 and 2011, they achieved the customary one win with an added bonus of a draw against Japan. However, in 2015, their one win record was soured. For the first time ever, Canada lost their every game. However, things weren't as bad as they sound. Canada really pushed Italy and could have won but for this try by Phil McKenzie being disallowed. And they were 15 nil up against Romania and could have won but for this late winner by Florin Vecu securing the biggest ever comeback in Rugby World Cup history. I was at that game and I vividly remember standing by the tunnel watching a crestfallen Canadian team stroll back to the changing room, looking like they'd just been told someone had rounded up all their dogs in the second half and dumped them in the ocean there to drown without even shitting themselves. This felt like a low at the time, but has gone on to be pretty much the norm for fans of Calm America since. Canada responded to those results by firing coach Kieran Crowley. The fact that this World Cup was one step in a long-term plan for Crowley was irrelevant. He was out and off to do a magnificent job in Italy with Benetton. Canada then quickly hired and equally quickly Fired, Giriff steered Mark Anscombe, cycling through bosses like Dark Souls out of an easy mode. Canada then brought in Kingsley Jones, a man who looks like he took a photo of a pineapple into the hairdressers, who's remained in the job since and is expected to stay in the post past the World Cup. These decisions came straight from the top. The current CEO of Rugby Canada is a man called Alan Vanson. Now, Vanson has extensive experience in running prosperous and successful sports things, but prior to getting the job he was not really a rugby man. As such, every decision has been made on a financial rather than a rugby logic. The team's performance and projections under Crowley and Anscombe didn't matter. They failed to hit the bottom line win rate wanted, so they went. Some calls are being made for far more straightforward financial corner cutting. When Jones did get the job, Vanson decided not to hire any assistants in order to save money. This meant former flanker Jones was left in charge of the backs, forwards, scrummaging, kicking everything himself. Considering most Saturday afternoon teams would struggle with one coach. Doing this at test level is tantamount to scoreboard suicide. However, the issues of Canadian rugby don't exist just at the top, but are unfortunately as vast as the country itself, right the way down to the lowest possible level of rugby in the country. Canada has around 30,000 registered male rugby players. Now, this already gives them the fifth smallest player pool of any team in the World Cup, but the stat becomes really problematic when you break it down further. Around 4,000 of those are not Canadian, they're expats or their visitors so we can go full Farage and just count them out. Of the remaining 26,000, just shy of 13,000 are under the age of 21. This makes pretty much half of the Canadian player pool underage. This isn't an encouraging sign, a sign of growth. This 50% figure has been roughly the same as far back as I could find. What this means is by the time most people who've ever picked up one of those odd rubber ovals in Canada hit the age of 21, they've stopped playing rugby. Canada have a really hard time transitioning youth players, no matter how promising, into senior players. And this is no wonder when you look at their player progression pathway. In order to go into more detail, however, let's do a case study. This is 
Canada the monkey. He's an incredibly promising young player who I bought in a gift shop in the CN Tower a few years ago. Having graduated junior rugby, he's now made his province as regional team and has been absolutely tearing up since then. The kid's as talented as his hat is garish. He's just made the Canadian national team squad for the first time, which will probably be a nightmare for commentators, and now he wants to take it to the next step and go pro. So traditionally, he has two options. Number one, hope a big European or super rugby team signs him. This is incredibly rare. Maybe half a dozen of Canada's World Cup squad will be on deals in Europe and only two Canadians have ever played in Super Rugby. Number two, hope to be carded by Rugby Canada themselves and hence have to move to Langford, British Columbia for pretty much the budgetary reasons I've previously mentioned. Until a few months ago, every single professional player in Canada had to be based in one town and contracted centrally to the union. And because Canada is so chronically massive, this means that players may, at 18 or 19 monkey years old, be forced to move eight or nine hours from home. And even once Canada gets there, there, he's at the behest of the union. Because they can only afford to pay a certain number of players, Rugby Canada has to use its resources economically. As such, you find players flitting between playing for the Canadian 15s team and the 7s team, unsure which code they'll be playing what week. Or, in the situation of starting standoff in 2015, Nate Hiriyama, who found himself thrust into the fly half shirt in a World Cup, having played fewer than five matches of 15s between 2012 and 15. This may make sense from a financial standpoint, but from a rugby perspective, it's positively perplexed. Complexing. It's like making the country's best F1 racers drive taxis because you want to conserve the amount of money spent on drivers. Canadian rugby is more underfunded than a small town library, but by cutting corners they're failing to make the most of the resources they do have. There is some hope however. In the last few months, Canada the Monkey has been given a third option after the introduction of the Toronto Arrows to Major League Rugby. Now, Canada can place players at the Arrows in Ontario rather than forcing them to flee to BC. MLR has generally given far more Canadian players a chance to play 15 aside rugby every week with most of their squad now based across the league, not exclusively in Toronto. However, once Canada does step up into the Canadian team, the problems continue. As I previously discussed, the current Canada coach is the aforementioned man in denial about being called Phil Kingsley Jones. Prior to taking over Canada, Jones was in charge of the Dragons, winning 23 out of his 88 games in charge, somehow managing to put a team as successful as Green Tea in a nightclub into reverse. Seriously, this is the guy who managed to make the Dragons worse. That's like meeting somebody who was pronounced dead that morning and still managing to ruin their day. Kingsley Jones started coaching in 2003, and as a technical coach, he's perfectly fine, he's entirely capable. But in terms of tactics, of game plan he's devised, and the structures his teams run, it's far less so. It's not that they're bad per se, it's that they're just years behind the curve. Canada's attack is incredibly straightforward. Modern structures in rugby are built around giving the ball carrier options in order to confuse the defence, as well as trucking up, any player in most top team structures could pass left, could pass right, could go out the back in order to open up a whole new world of possibilities. Canada's attack is not like this. Each player is either going to take the ball into contact themselves or ship it onto the next player down the line. There's no variety. There's more options when you pass to a pod in Rugby 08. This is incredibly simple to defend. It's an attack undone by the most basic drift defence, providing the tackling is competent. There's no breaking teams down. What points Canada do score are simply because, even with Canada the Monkey having quit rugby before the age of 21, they have some really useful players. Chief amongst them is one of my absolute favourite players that will be at this year's World Cup, the nicest man in rugby himself, Tyler Ardron. Able to play lock or anywhere in the back row, Ardron is shamelessly skillful and endlessly hard working and has a surprising turn of pace and excellent hands on him as well. Having now taken the step down of having to partner only the second best lock in the world after playing with Alan jones for a few years, Ardron has made a massive impression in Super Rugby, being hugely impressive in the one competition I can't actually show you clips of so you just need to take my word for it. However, one man that does generate clips worth showing constantly is DTH van der Merwe, a world-class finisher who's not only the all-time top try scorer for Canada, but also for Glasgow Warriors and previously held the record for the Pro 14 competition at large. Other standouts include Locke, Evan Olmsted, who looks a bit like the bastard love child of Florence Welsh and Jason Momoa, Justice Sears Duru, a handful of a loose head with a name that is instantly iconic, fittingly named Lucas Rumble, who's an excellent ball carrier, and then a few experienced old heads. Prop Hubert Bidens will probably be the oldest player at this year's World Cup at age 38. Kieran Hearn was a huge standout for me in the last World Cup in 2015. And then finally, stalwart centre Nick Blevins, who I'm only mentioning because he looks like a beleaguered cop who turned to drink after he failed to solve his daughter's murder. This makes for very mixed signals. Even losing the players they do, Canada still has enough talent to be dangerous, but you worry they're being strangled by playing in a system modern teams can defend so easily. I would love to see Kansas storm back to form in Japan and make me look like an absolute idiot for saying this, but I really worry the way things are going, Canada are going to get left 
further and further behind the pack. Because when the national team is failing to perform as such, what motivation is there for young players quitting before the age of 21 to continue playing? Their pathways are getting blocked, the money is scarcely there, and their days in the test team are likely to be frustrating and dry. They're playing for pride and the love of the game. And while that's noble, you need a bit more than that to win a World Cup, perhaps even qualify next time. Canada were the last team to book their place in this year's competition, and were probably lucky Romania's dismissal meant they avoided playing off of a Russian team they just lost to for the final spot. Because much as I unashamedly love Canada, the closer we get to this World Cup, the browner their trunks, and the further underwater they sink. It's up to Canada to save themselves, to learn to swim. Their resources won't increase without a successful World Cup, and they're just going to have to get the best rather than the most out of them. All I can say is Godspeed, Canada. You can do this, you overly polite syrup guzzlers. You can do this. So, as ever, I want to begin by thanking... You. 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 Yes, you. You. For watching this video uh, and also to everyone that supports the channel on Patreon, I really, really appreciate it. It makes a massive difference to myself, to the channel, to everything in my immediate vicinity, even if not the, the world beyond it. Um, so thank you. But particularly this week, I want to pick up on two particular people uh, to thank. Firstly, uh, Mr. Nathan Fish, who did a lot of the background digging, a lot of the background research for the video. He just offered uh, basically out of the blue and was an enormous help in digging up on the financial side and on the player development pathway side and allowed me to focus a bit on the rugby itself, which was really, really useful. So thank you, Mr. Fish. Thank you, Nathan. That was a huge, huge difference. I really appreciate it. Um, and additionally to the, the, the star, I guess you could say, the guy who really brought his star power to this video, this guy, Canada the Monkey, who is quite possibly the greatest purchase I have made in the gift tower in the CN Tower, um, the gift shop, rather. Um, I did also buy a Pepsi Max in the cafe, uh, which was massively overpriced. I don't know why I'm telling you this now, and that is exactly why, for this rambling reason, I'm going to stop recording right now. I'm probably not going to do another take because that would take so much longer. Why am I still going?